We are back for the second to last edition this semester and last with this crew with Michael Rizzo and Trevor Martin. I'm Isaiah Rosner. We have three BSU sports to talk about tonight, none of which are football. First up is volleyball here on Cardinal Sports Live. Women's volleyball played in the MAC tournament right before Thanksgiving. They beat Central Michigan, a team that had lost that they had lost to twice during the regular season in four sets, leading them to the championship game. That one was against Bowling Green. They split the first four sets with all four being won 25 to 23 before losing in the fifth and final set. What do you guys make of their performance? Yeah, Isaiah, it was really a very impressive performance from both sides, from both Bowling Green and Ball State. Nobody could pull away, like you mentioned, every set except for the fifth one going, you know, 25-23, which is as close as you can get without it going, you know, to extra points there. So very impressive, you know, game from both sides, obviously. Ball State could not win even though it was at home hosting the MAC tournament, but still, um, I would say impressive for both sides to be able to battle to that fifth set. Uh, and Ball State's actually had success in fifth sets throughout most of the season, just could not pull away uh, there in the championship game. But some key stats I wanted to mention, Bowling Green uh, had the advantage in kills 70-52, to 52 and just held, held Ball State to just a 123 hitting percentage, which is one of the lowest of the season, um, and also had a 15 to 8 advantage in blocks as well. So a lot of those advantages there um, for Bowling Green in their favor there for that championship game. But some key players for Ball State, Marie Plitt had 14 kills, 29 in the whole tournament, and also had a 419 attack percentage. So she led the way like she's done a lot of the season in a big moment, a fifth-year senior uh, in a championship-like atmosphere, did a great job with that. But the other pl uh, player I want to mention is the sophomore, Megan Walonsky, had 47 of Ball State's 51 assists in the final, also had 15 digs, so that was her 20th double-double in 32 matches. So over half of the season, she's been able to get those double-doubles and has been a solid server most of the season, also um, in assists and digs as well. That's been a lot of her combinations for those double-doubles all season. So she and Marie Plitt really led the way uh, to Ball State, not being able to come up with a victory, but still very close and be able to get that at-large bid in the NCAA tournament. Very impressive for this team. Yeah, Bowling, Green, uh, Bowling Green was able to slow down uh, Ball State's offense with 15 total blocks, the most for a Ball State opponent all season long. Bowling Green also held uh, Ball State to a point .123 attack percentage, while they had a point .201 attack percentage. <clears throat> Despite that, the volleyball team played overall pretty well and had some great stats. You mentioned Marie Plitt. She also had 14 kills and a point .394 attack percentage. Her 14 kills in the uh, championship game raised her career to kills to 999, only one away from 1,000 career kills, which would have put her 13th among Ball State volleyball players, but she wasn't able to accomplish that. Overall tournament stats, she had 29 kills and a .419 attack percentage with six blocks. Maggie Huber, another outstanding performer, tied her career high with 35 digs in the championship match and finished the tournament with 65 total digs in a 7 to 22 digs per set uh, average. And then Kate Snyder uh, led the Cards offense with 16 kills and finished the tournament uh, with a team high 37 kills on a 4 to 11 kills per set average. Over, overall, uh, the team played great. It was a great matchup. Two really good teams, but in the end, one has to win, and it sadly wasn't Ball State. Well, the good news for the Cardinals is they received an at-large bid into the NCAA tournament, an event that actually started this evening. They face four-seed Marquette at 8 p.m. tonight. Uh, what does the team need to do to try and pull off the first-round upset? Yeah, the first thing really that this team needs to do is remain the well-balanced team that we've seen the whole season. Right now, Ball State currently fifth in the nation with 18 digs per set and also in the top 40 at 39th with 14 kills per set as well. Um, so I would say, you know, those statistical categories really leading the way for Ball State. It's been a huge point of emphasis this season, the digs uh, per set and, of course, the kills as well. But as you flip to the, to the other side for Marquette, they're a team 
27 and 3, 17 and 1, they finished in the Big East. But what's interesting about them is they actually got an at-large bid as well, too, because they fell to Creighton in the Big East final, which is odd because they dominated most of the season, were the number two seed in the Big East, and then unfortunately fell for them there uh, in the championship. Uh, but as you can see this graphic here, they're ranked 16th in the country, fourth in the region uh, that Ball State is a part of, and Marquette, of course, as well. But Marquette's a team, one of the best offenses in the nation, sixth uh, with a 293 attack percentage, and also seventh in the nation, <coughs> 15 kills per set, so just above Ball State, who averages 14. Um, but I think both teams, you know, are hungry to win in advance. Both, you know, felt like they were deserving to be the automatic bid. Both fell in their cha respective conference championships. So I think both teams are going to be hungry, willing to, you know, put it all on the line to advance to the next round. Because Ball State did that against Michigan last year. So we'll see if they can repeat that and be able to get a first round win uh, here tonight, here in about half an hour against Marquette. Yeah, last year, uh, Ball State were able to beat a team that was definitely favored over them, and that being Michigan. People thought Michigan was going to go far, just like how people think this Marquette team is going to go far. But like Trevor said, this Marquette team is really good. 16th in the country, 4th in the region, with the 6th best attack percentage with a .293, a 7th kill per set at 15. Uh, we saw against Bowling Green that Bowling Green was able to slow down Ball State's offense with uh, uh, the 15 blocks that they had. If Ball State could step up defensively, get more uh, blocks, you look at um, girls like Marie Plitt, Natalie Metrum, those kind of players out there, to get more blocks. If they could do that, slow down that .293 attack percentage of Marquette, I think they have a chance at coming back and playing well. Because all they need is the offense to stay where they're at, just step up a little bit on defense, and I think you have a shot. Are there any particular Ball State players you see having a particularly big impact on this match? Yeah, really, the two I want to highlight here on the experience, I think that both Marie Plitt and Natalie Reese add to the team. They have, you know, both done phenomenal jobs in their senior seasons as leaders because yeah, because they've been there before too. I think that's a big factor uh, when you have that. But when you look at the stats, you know, for Marie Plitt in the stati statistical leaders category, she leads the team with 327 kills on the season as a whole, which is uh, which is surprisingly 39 more than Kate Snyder, who has 288 in second. So that just sh goes to show that she's far and away when she gets up by that net, she's going to smack it down and get those kills. So she's led the way, of course, really a lot of her career in this season for sure, stepping up as a big leader uh, and leading the team in kills. And then Natalie Reese as well. She's just a very well-rounded player for this Ball State team because as you look at the categories, she's fourth in kills, has 271 of those, third in digs, 349, fourth in assists as well with 28, and also at blocks, she has 32 of those, which just puts her fifth on the team. And finally, if that's not enough, she's tied for second in aces with 31 as well. So she just leads it, you know, from serving to kills. I mean, she's just, the, I would say, the most well-rounded player that Ball State has, and you're going to need that in a tournament-like atmosphere. So I think Natalie Reese for sure, but with the combination of Marie Plitt, the experience, how they play is going to be very crucial, and I think that's what can lead this team to hopefully an upset win over Marquette. I mean, can I say the whole team, guys? Like, <laughs> Every matchup, it's always a different player that's out there that's having a great, great match. Um, I mean, I mentioned Marie Plitt, who's 14th nationally in attack percent, uh, percentage. Kate Snyder having a breakout season offensively. Uh, th and the always consistent Megan Wolanski. Maggie Huber, who leads the team with a 4.61 digs per set average. And there's still plenty of players I haven't mentioned. I mean, you, you mentioned Natalie Reese, Natalie Mitchum. There's plenty more. Lauren Gillen. This team is loaded with talent and a lot of experience all along the floor. Uh, and each one, each player out there brings something different to the floor. And, you know, if they get this win here, I don't think we should be shocked. They're a talented team. They do have to step up a little bit defensively, but any one of them could step up and get this win for us. Well, great three-point shooting led to a successful road trip for the women's basketball team. We'll get to that next. Every day, thousands of kids start vaping. And I can't let this happen to my kid. So if you want to talk to your kids, you have to get it trending. No, you're doing it wrong. Let's go. <laughs> Can we talk? Yeah, what's up? Visit talkaboutvaping.org for tips on when and how to have the vape talk. I like to eat, eat, eat apples and bananas. I want to eat, eat, eat apples and bananas. I need to eat, eat, eat apples and bananas. Why can't I eat, eat, eat apples and bananas?
support the Feeding America nationwide network of food banks to help provide meals to those in need. Join us at feedingamerica.org. Feel the beat of nature at a park or forest near you. Find a forest and music inspired by nature at discovertheforest.org. We are back and ready to talk some hoops. Women's basketball had a two-game road trip out west to face Utah State and the Mormons of BYU. The Cardinals won the games by a margin of 25 and 5, respectively. What did Ball State do to pick up these wins? Yeah, really, I think it was great scoring distribution in both games. We saw some, uh, I think, four players in double figures in the Utah State game. So on the season, uh, four and two is the record for this Ball State women's basketball team. And I think, you know, looking what they have coming up ahead before the max slate, I think they can really pick up some wins before we get into that t always tough 18 game max slate later on in the season. Um, but I think the biggest key would, was unselfish basketball, a lot of assists as well. This team does a great job distributing the ball among the, the best players on the team and some bench points as well uh, was impressive. But some key stats from those games is that the team shot over 40% from the field, um, averaged about 35% from three. Also, a uh, big key factor, 33 rebounds per game, 16 assists. So like I mentioned, the unselfishness, that's why, because you have 16 assists per game. And also in both games, nine total blocks and 11 steals as well. So really doing it on, on both offense and defense. The blocks were impressive. Um, you got you know, Marie Kiefer in there at 6'2". She's going to be a big factor in every game. So had a big factor there with the blocks and the steals. I know Allie Becky's always great at quick with, the, with that, quick with her hands. Um, but also as you look at the defense as a whole, held Utah State and BYU in both games to under 20% or 25% rather from the three-point line. And also in those two games, forced 35 turnovers. So I think 22 of those were against Utah State. They've had a struggling season. But still, 35 turnovers to force, very impressive um, for Ball State, the women's basketball team. So I think that you know, those two wins, you know, over Thanksgiving break on the road, away from your family there in Utah, um, but still to pull away two wins, improved and now four and two. I like the trajectory of the season and where this team is going. Right now they're playing really balanced basketball, both right now on offense and defense. And like Trevor said, unselfish basketball leads to wins. And that's what they're doing right now, and they're doing a good job of it. At Utah State, uh, 11 players scored. Uh, and, and 40 points came from the bench. When you have a bench that could score, come out, you could just plug it and play, and they could get to the basket for you and score half the overall points that they had in that game, that's really good, especially down the stretch. Uh, and then at BYU, Ali Becky had a great game, 17 points while hitting three three-pointers and five rebounds to help push the cards past BYU. Overall, two really good games that they had out west, and now they come back home to hopefully continue this winning streak. The Cardinals now have three straight games at home, with the first one being tomorrow against Western Kentucky. One, team, or one thing this team hasn't had this year is a consistent scorer. Anna Clefane leads the team with 12.2 uh, yeah, points per game, and Madeline Bischoff is the only other player in double figures. Is there anyone that needs to step up offensively in these next few matchups? Yeah, Isaiah, the player that comes to my mind is Toma Desaugstadter. She's a fifth-year graduate student. I always like to say she's from Keflavik, Iceland. I just like saying that. I think it's fun. <laughs> um, but currently on the season, just under eight points per game at 7.7. .7. But as you look at last year, she averaged 10.9, so nearly 11 points, which maybe doesn't seem like that much. It's only three points less. But this is where really it really gets me is um, her field goal percentage. On the season, just 29% from the field overall. And from three-point range, just 22%, 9 for 41. So definitely she's in a slump right now for sure, I would say. Um, but as you look at last year's stat, it was 40% from the field, made 84 threes, 37% she was on the season. So definitely I would just say it's interesting that, that the first six games she's just really struggled to kind of put consistency together be able to knock down those threes at big moments because last year I, I went to quite a few women's basketball games and she would light them up you know in any certain quarter she'd make two or three and really change the momentum of the game and I just haven't seen that from her this year I think she's just been a bit off obviously she's missed what um, you know 32 threes this season so that's definitely not her usual forte how she's played for four years at Ball State that's not been where she's typically been I think she'll get out of it for sure I think her consistency will come back she'll get back in the groove of things but right now just seeing a little bit of a struggle from her but if she can step up I think this team you'll see more points scored more distribution in points like we talked about you'll see her maybe hopefully in double figures here soon with points per game so I think she'll step up and kind of snap out of it this, the, the little uh, slump that she's in but I think we'll see her improve and that will uh, in effect add for the whole team as well yeah, Trevor's right. If Donald uh, DeSagostar could improve and get that added three points going, that would be amazing. Another person I look at that can improve, though she had a really good game last game, 
I'm going with Ellie Becky. She's been hot or cold all season long. Um, you know, uh, she's either scored 17 or 18 points like she did against BYU, uh, or she scores lower than six uh, in, in, and stuff like that. So she just needs to get consistent. Uh, when she played great, she's on fire, like I said. BYU, 17 points, three, three steals and three assists on 46% from the field. Or she's cold, like against Tennessee Tech, the first game of the season, where she had two points and four turnovers. If she could turn that around, be the player that we saw last year, and maybe a little better than that, this team you know, could be lights out. I mean, well, she had preseason all-math first team. Uh, so if she could just step up, be more consistent, this team could definitely uh, roll on some wins. Men's basketball just finished up a road trip of their own, this one to the Bahamas. We'll discuss the results next. My name is Gary Parker. I served as a Cavalry Scout and a military policeman in the United States Army for 20 years. When I was a Cavalry Scout, we had a young lieutenant that came in, great guy, but he moved on, got promoted to lieutenant colonel, went on to Afghanistan, and I was able to keep in contact. And I'd wake up one morning, go on social media, and there's that post you don't want to see. For whatever reason, he, he took his own life. Nobody knows why he did it. And if there's something that we could have done to prevent it from happening, safe gun storage can prevent gun suicide because it's that added step to get to your firearm that might just give somebody a moment of reflection on what they're doing. As a veteran, we need to be ambassadors to people that don't have the knowledge that we have. Anytime you're not storing a weapon safely, you're putting yourself and your community at risk. Service never stops. Today, we face an unprecedented crisis. Tens of millions of refugees have been forced from their homes. But you can make a difference. Turn disruption and despair to hope and opportunity. Even small amounts make a big difference. Provide shelter, support, or jobs in your community. The more we understand, the greater sense of belonging we create. Act now. Visit supportcrisisrelief.org. Victor deployed for the first time to Afghanistan in 2003. He sustained a moderate traumatic brain injury. Basically, he had to relearn everything. One of the most important elements of caregiving is taking care of yourself. We have our own journey, and we can fulfill that journey at the same time that we are helping our loved one. Visit aarp.org slash caregiving for a free military veteran's guide to navigate your caregiving journey. Thanks for joining us live tonight on Cardinal Sports Live. I'm Isaiah Rosner. To my left is Trevor, and to his left is Rizzo. The men's basketball team competed in, in the Nassau Championship in the Bahamas. They lost in the first round, won a consolation game, and lost the fifth, the fifth place game to San Jose State, securing a final placing of sixth out of eight teams. Uh, the most alarming stat I noticed is that in those three games, the Cardinals scored a total of just 23 points off the bench. So do you guys think this is a big concern going forward? Uh, and feel free to give any other thoughts on that tournament as well. Yeah, Isaiah, that's I would say it's definitely a concern because across three games, if you can only get 23 bench points, that's, you know, down the stretch as we get into, like I said earlier with the women, the 18-game max slate, that's going to be a problem because your starters are going to get, uh, not hurt, but like, you know, they're going to get tired throughout the game. You've got to have bench production to be able to kind of fill in, whether it's, it's midpoint of the second half. Sometime you just have to be able to get the, though, though the starters are very good, but you have to have that bench production as well to have a very successful team, a well-rounded team, all those factors for sure. But back to, like you said, mentioning the tournament, um, it did not go as well as we'd hoped, um, but I would say, but both losses were very close. The first loss, you know, the first game was against Vermont, lost by only five points, 78 to 73. But one thing I put down about Vermont, of course, I'm a big college basketball fan. I watch a lot of games throughout the season. And, and they're a team that has pulled off upsets before, and you know they are tournament bound usually every season, whether they're you know a 12, 13 seed, whatever. But usually they're a team that can pull off upsets. So to be within five of them, I think is very impressive. Um, but Ball State, you know, some factors in that game did have 10 steals and also shot 52 percent from the field. So to be able to shoot that well, get the steals, that's going to be good to go going forward. But the ones that I did point out, 46 percent at the free throw line, 11 for 24. So even if you can make five or six more of those, that changes the trajectory of the entire game. You know, not asking Ball State to make them all, but to miss 13 of those, that can really change the, uh, the emphasis and the, the trajectory of the game itself. Um, so that was really the difference in that first game. Second game, Missouri State, one by three, um, and some factors there shot really well, 44% from three, 32 rebounds, four blocks, seven steals, and then finally that final game, lost to San Jose State, 67-65, only shot 24% from the three-point line, 
was 4 for 17, but the free throw shooting much better, 21 for, tw for 28, and also had four players in double figures. So when you can have that, we've mentioned the distribution and scoring, that's going to be a huge factor, and that's what's going to lead to success for a team. So we finally saw that in the last game, tough loss, but again, seven combined points to, and two losses, that's good. So though the team 4-3, and three, still above 500, I think the way we saw them play in the Palmas hopefully can translate to the rest of the season. Yeah, I'm going to have to agree with your question there. Uh, 23 points from the bench in the total tournament, that's not a good stat to have. And it's the exact opposite what the women's could do. They had, you know, like I said, 40 points from the bench in one game, and they could only have 23 in a whole tournament. Uh, th that's not a th good thing to have. You want to have a good bench that you, you, you get a lot of points out of because when you go deep, like you said, into the season uh, or into, the, uh, into a tournament, you need those guys off the bench that can go out there, you can plug and play, plug and score right off the bench, and, and you know, you could put them in in any situation and you could rely on them. And right now we don't have that. I know we currently have Luke Bumbleo, a guy that we have had starting in years past coming off the bench. And it looks like they're trying to play him in a different role. It looks like they're trying to have him as a spot-up shooter in the corner this year. That's something he hasn't done in years past. He hasn't been that shooter for us. But that's something a person to look at that could possibly step up for us. We've seen him play really good for us before, but right now he's a little bit on a, on a down tear, if you will. But other few things that I've noticed that concerned me, I kind of mentioned it there, three-point percentage, only 36% from the three. If you could get that up to around 40% and above that, that would be amazing. So if they could you know, get more three-point shooting and then it goes along with three-point shooting, defending the three in the perimeter defense. Uh, this has been something I think that is the Ball State men's basketball team that struggled the last two years, I'd say. Uh, really, they haven't been good at any of these two facets since the 2019-2020 uh, season. Uh, so if they could turn it around, you know, play harder on defense, especially on the perimeter, because they're good defensively around the paint. But perimeter, we saw guys like, uh, I think it was IU South Bend who scored a lot on us. Um, and then another team earlier this season, I forgot the name of them, but they were just able to shoot in from anywhere, and it, it just was not good for us, uh, and, and they stayed in the game. So if they could just get those things fixed, I think this team could uh, build on it and get better. Ball State now has two more games on the road. They face Duquesne on Saturday and then Eastern Illinois on Wednesday. Besides bench scoring, what do the Cards need to do to get back on track? It's one of the biggest factors for the season, I think, is we need to continue to be dominant on the boards. 37 rebounds per game this team averages, and the two players lead the way. Peyton Sparks did it last year as well, averaging almost a double-double. He averages eight rebounds per game, and also the return of Jerron Coleman for this season. He averages five rebounds per game as well. Um, but this team, I think, can get to where they want because of the physical play, because of how aggressive they rebound. And if you can average 37 rebounds per game, you're likely going to out-rebound a lot of your opponents, which in that category can always lead to closer games, and hopefully down the stretch you can be able to come away with victories as well. Um, the second factor is cutting down on turnovers, 93 total. 13 turnovers per game. And finally, keeping the offensive consistency, 77 points per game. But they do shoot almost 50% from the field and also 17 points off turnovers. So those factors, I think, can be good for this team going forward. Yeah, I did mention a lot of them there that I wanted to say. Uh, becoming the three points and, and the perimeter defense there. So really, that's all they really, in my opinion, that they got to work on. Obviously, turnovers help too uh, and getting better at the free throw line. But it's really three-point defense there, the perimeter defense. It's killing them right now, not being able to shoot the three. They're, like, they're getting at 36%, but you need that higher if you want to compete in the MAC. Uh, so just be more confident when you're at the line and all that. Uh, but other way, they're really good you know, at rebounds, like I said, 37th rebounds per game. Uh, pretty efficient on every other offensive stat. So overall, if they could get those things better, like I said, they have a good shot at winning some games you know, down the stretch. We have one segment left, and as always, it's Athlete of the Week. Don't go anywhere. This is CSL. STEM is everywhere, like here, behind the scenes of The Walking Dead. When we break down clothes, we tumble it with trisodium phosphate, rock salt, and dish detergent. We stitched together images of our model and created a 3D set that can be walked through in a VR headset. We're able to turn 12 walkers into a thousand walker board. STEM can create new worlds on and off the screen. What will you make with STEM? Get inspired at shecanstem.com. Take a look under your bed. Find stuff under there? What about jobs? No? Now try your closet. 
Still no jobs, just more stuff? Well, you really have both. See, stuff is defined as household articles considered as a group. Sometimes this stuff is no longer needed. Wait, no longer needed? I can't be right. Because remember those jobs you were looking for? Those are really needed. And they're the stuff inside your stuff. Our job is to unlock those jobs. And it starts when you donate your stuff to your local Goodwill. Here's how we do it. When you donate to Goodwill, we sell your stuff to provide job training for people right here in your community. So just by teaming up with Goodwill, you help create jobs. And isn't that worth parting with the leftover guitar from your 80s cover band? Goodwill. Donate stuff, create jobs. Every day. Every day. Millions of people are connecting. And even though we're overcoming obstacles, watching each other's backs, and banding together, we should still make an effort. We should still make an effort to get to know each other on a deeper level. Father, cosplayer, mentor, actor. It's time we take a step forward. It's time we take a step forward. Come together and discover how accepting our differences can, can make, make us stronger. We're back as we broadcast live from Ball State University, and it is time to give our Athletes of the Week the top Cardinal performers over the past seven days. Trevor, you're up first. So for, I have to go with Madeline Bischoff for my Athlete of the Week this week. She's a sophomore on the women's basketball team from Indianapolis, Indiana, went to Ron Colley High School. Um, the reason I picked her for this week is she has scored double figures in the last two games, like we talked about Utah State and BYU. Was lead, leading scorer in the Utah State game, I think third leading scorer in the BYU game. So that's why I picked her for this week. Um, but also on the season in six games, she has scored 10 or more in five of those six games. And like we mentioned earlier on the season, she's right behind Anna Clefane, averages 10.7 points per game, second leading score. But the, another reason to mention her is that last year as a freshman, she averaged just three points per game. So she averages almost 11 more, or eight more points per game than she did last year. Um, she also leads the team with 11 made threes, and is also first in three-point field goal percentage with 34% as well. So a lot of those factors is why I chose her for my Athlete of the Week. Her tur complete turnaround from last season as well to be able to start this season. She kind of came off the bench later on in games when maybe they're already decided. Last year, this year definitely took on a bigger role and has really shown how, how great she can shine in a big moment as a starter. So that's why I chose her for my Athlete of the Week for this week. Yeah, I've got uh, Peyton Sparks. He had a career game against Missouri State. His first double-double of the season, uh, a career-high 24 points with 12 rebounds and shot 8 of 10 from the field. Also, the big man knocked down a three. So overall, he's playing really good this year. Um, I hope he could, he could stay on that, on that course like we see last year, and he's just now getting better. If he could be on that tear like he was all last year and what it's looking like this year, this team could be pretty good with him uh, when he's on a roll like that. My Athlete of the Week is Kate Snyder. I mean, she was absolutely dominant in that first win uh, for, for the volleyball team in the MAC tournament and then played very well as well in the second one, the, the one that they ended up losing. 37 total kills uh, she had, and I mean, you know, again, really close game in that MAC final. So didn't quite didn't quite uh, get the win, but still fantastic yeah. job by her. She, she, you know, pretty much, she was a huge, huge part of that overall. Um, but yeah, that, that will just about do it. So um, before we go, though, uh, I mean, you know, it's a fun time in sports. We have the World Cup going on right now. Rizzo, I know you probably want to talk about the Steelers-Colts game. Yes, I do. <laughs> Steelers beat your Colts. That was great to and see. And my Colts, too. So that's, but that's yeah, right. yeah, yeah. But yeah. I think but on Saturday, we're all going to be rooting for USA, right? Over the oh, yeah. So let's, let's 10 go. 10 a.m. Saturday. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's better be tuning in on Fox. Beat those Dutch. Well, that will do it for Cardinal Sports Live. For Trevor Martin, Michael Rizzo, and all of our crew, this is Isaiah Rosner saying good night from Muncie.